Welcome to the ID10T podcast number 1118. Go over to ID10T.com for all the uh, latest stuff that we're putting there. Uh, um, pop culture merchandise that is uh, possibly relevant to your interests. You can sign up for our email list there, which I encourage you to do, especially as um, as live stand-up shows start to come back, uh, which will be in the, hopefully in the coming months, I'll announce some dates. So if you sign up for the email list, uh, you will be ahead of the curve on that. Uh, and also we're just releasing new stuff all the time. So check it out over at ID10T.com. But let's talk about you, the ID10T community and the corkboard events at ID10T.com. Like Ryan, who writes, I'm writing to the corkboard because my wife and her best friend made a thing. And that thing is a podcast called Status Macabre. Uh, it's a podcast that focuses on true crime, ghosts, slash hauntings, and all things macabre that can be found uh, on all of the podcast platforms. Uh, they've already made some road trips and have already recorded one of their episodes in Key West Graveyard and have plans to stay in a haunted hotel in Savannah. Uh, you can find info on all of their socials, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Status Macabre, uh, and that's M-A-C-A-B-R-E. Uh, he says, I know they would appreciate it. It's a shout out and the opportunity to get more people listening in. Thank you for submitting this ryan uh uh status macabre the podcast events at id10t.com for everyone else who wants to uh, submit their thing this episode is dr hakeem olushe who uh is a brilliant astrophysicist and an inventor and a writer and a musician uh he literally does pretty much everything and he's brilliant at everything he was on the podcast a handful of years ago and we became pals after that and i just so admire him and his work uh his he has a new book coming out in june 15th called a quantum life my unlikely journey from the street to the stars uh also season nine of how the universe works wednesdays at 8 p.m uh on the science channel also streaming on Discovery Plus. Here's the ID10T podcast number 1118 with Hakeem Olushe, which starts right after the intro music. Initiating ID10T protocol. Oh my god, it's so good to see you! Same, man! Wow! Um, listen, man, I'm in orbit around Jupiter at this very moment. <laughs> I mean, so, how could you have anything as your background other than, than something planetary? Right. Dude, it's so good to see you, man. It's dude, good to I got see so you. much to tell. I got so much. Dude, listen. You are gonna, like, just split your pants when you hear what you did. So <laughs> what did I do something? Did I, I hope it was good. Uh, dude, life changing good. So I appeared on this little podcast <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the interviewer was so awesome that the interview turned out so amazingly that, you know, I had been on a search literally for almost 15 years to find a literary agent. And after I appeared on, after I, you interviewed me, a bunch came. And oh my I, God, that's the best! Yes, and the one that I selected, I mean, not the one that I selected, the one that I bonded with, you know, the one that was like, dude, you get me, right? I got a two book deal, and the first book is the one they told you about, and it's about to come out. And the early stuff is just like, uh-oh, what have I gotten myself into? Because it's like ravingly good. So oh, that it, that makes me so happy. I dude, loved having you on. It's been, I feel like it's been like four years now, maybe four, four years, five, or so, five years, five years. Oh yeah. God. And uh, it was such a fun conversation. And Absolutely. and, you know, like I'm I, I was a fan of yours before and I continue to be a oh, fan man. of yours. I'm so glad. You know. I'm glad that your book's coming out. I'm glad you have another season of how the universe works. I'm glad that there's a lot of s space stuff to talk about too. Like it's oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh my God. Right. You think we'd run out. You think we'd done it, you know, cause every year it is like, Oh, you know, what are we going to do? What is there to do? And then man, 
wait a decade, see what happens. Wait five years, see what happens. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's like, it's like, okay, rover on Mars, that's huge. Wait a minute, space helicopter? You know, like. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> right, right. Remember when skateboard on Mars was huge? Huge. You know, what, what blows me away that a lot of people don't know is that Russia sent a probe, sent a, a probe to Venus in the 70s. Absolutely. Yeah, and, the Venera probe. And they knew that the atmosphere on Venus, which I think is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, was going to melt the thing. But they managed to squeeze off just a few shots, like right before yeah. the thing. It's like they went through this yeah. whole thing and it landed and then melted. But no one, know, ever, right? like most people don't know anything about the fact that there would, that there are shots from Venus. And I wonder why right. we've never gone back. You know why, man? Because it's so deadly. That's my thought. That's my guess. Uh, yeah. if, if you're a scientist and you have to, you know, like, you know what I just realized literally last week, literally last week. Literal, the, the real meaning of literally, not <laughs> <laughs> not figuratively, literally, 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 not figuratively, literally, 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 man. You know, we and, and the phrase that really kicked it off for me is, uh, it was about the 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 uh, vaccine, you know, and someone on television saying that everyone who wants to get a vaccine can get a vaccine, all right. And I don't know how this triggered this thought, but I thought about all the scientific proposals I submitted that gets like all excellent and maybe one very good rating, but yet goes unfunded. Now imagine how powerful our scientific enterprise would be if we took the same attitude. Every sound scientific proposal will be funded. Right. Rather than, oh, we're gonna fund 10% of sound scientific proposals. I never thought about that before. It's, you know, because it's, Obviously, the the much less significant but closest analogy I have is you know how many how many pilots get made that no one ever sees, and that doesn't even that that's not even we're not even talking oh, yeah. about like the betterment of mankind yeah. and the progress of science. Yeah. We're talking about yeah. oh god, there's so many shows, but it never occurred to me like what a small that there must be, I mean, an incalculable amount of scientific research that would have been world changing that just for whatever reason, whether it was just didn't get into the right hands or the right funding or political or whatever, just like, just, just like, who knows where we'd be? Absolutely. It oh, just, just, just disappears into, you know, you'd never see it because trust me, you know, when you fight your way up to becoming a person who's submitting proposals, you know what I mean? Like it, right. just the fact that you're submitting them, you, it's already says something about your expertise and who you are and what you've done. But man, I've sat on, I don't know how many dozens of proposal evaluations, and you're always limited by the pool of money. They're always, you know, the sad news is, going all the way back to when I first got my PhD in 1999, right? The sad news is we're only going to be able to afford to do. So here's your instructions for evaluating this, this group of proposals, and you're, that's what's limiting you. Wouldn't it be great if we had a pot of money? And we had amazing ideas and they all got funded and there was some left over, some money left over, you know. I tell you what, I, I, I guess probably 2010, maybe I went, uh, I was visiting MIT mm. and I was doing a, a, a piece of video piece on mm. the puzzle hunt, their famous MIT puzzle hunt, which mm -hmm. is one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen in my life, which is ah complicated and too complicated to go into right now. But basically every right. year at MIT, they would do this puzzle hunt where teams of people, the previous year's winner would construct the puzzle and ah. they would perform some type of sketch. And, uh, and then all these teams would gather clues from the sketch and go off and they would have to solve like all these little puzzles, which would solve a meta puzzle, which then mm. would reveal a neck, a new set of puzzles for another meta puzzle. And then another set of puzzle for a meta puzzle. And the three meta puzzles would be the puzzle for an even more meta puzzle. And then that wow. would solve, and they would do this in a weekend. No one would sleep. It was unbelievable. And I had that realization at that time, like, if you aim enough nerds at something, they're going to figure shit out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Dude, my career has been nerd mercenary for hire, right? That's, right. That, you know, yeah, it, it's not been, oh, here's my area and that's what I do. It's like, because let me tell you, you know, you, you already know this. Every time you hear someone talk about their research, you're like, wow, 
that's fascinating. I want to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Like, I, I really have a lot. You know, there's a lot of ways to go about getting the same job done. And, you know, the fact that our talents and our abilities are distributed, you know, we're not clones of each other, is a, is a very good thing. And I really appreciate those who just stick with one thing forever, you know, and, you know, we need them. But, you know, I think you also need those fresh eyes, you know, on a problem. And when you're already in, you know, youth gives you fresh eyes, but they're fresh and experienced eyes. So the brain is operating different. So that's the superpower. But there's another superpower of having a well-trained brain that's looking at a fresh area, right? Because you have this entire toolbox. You can go like, oh, that's hard under your training, but under this training, that's super easy, you know? Well, and also like the, the sort of conventional thinking from when we were growing up was like, you got to specialize in one thing and that's it. And absolutely. And now I think we're realizing that that, like you said, yes, some people can do that if that happens to be your forte, if that happens to be what you're drawn to. But I think it's also refreshing for people to hear you say that because mm. I think some people who are interested in science who might feel constrained by, but I don't know if I want to just focus on one thing to hear like you don't, you, you can focus on a lot of different things because the idea of interdisciplinary study is yeah. also in and of itself, I imagine is incredibly powerful because if you spe- if, if if you have one area of expertise and someone else has something else, you might see problems from a totally different perspective and be able to create, which I believe is what you were saying, to create yeah. a fresh perspective because you're not, you know, academia is amazing, but it can also be very confining at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just being a human being in a human, you know, that's the crazy thing. We get it, it, it's it's like, you know isolation is sort of a crucible of creation, right? If you, if you take two groups of humans, separate some on this planet, separate some on that planet, after another generations, after several generations, right? They're, you know, which ones are the humans? They're gonna, right. they're, you know, that isolation created that creation. Having time alone as a creative person, you can create. But then again, being with others is such a powerful thing for creation, you know? So it's, it's like there's all these, Anyway, man, we're supposed to be talking about the universe. What, what, we can we talk, talk about, about anything. Interview? No, no, listen, we can talk about anything <laughs> right. we want because yeah, I great, think great. It's, also, it's also inspiring for people who, yeah. you know, because people going into science might have a lot of preconceived notions about what it is, what it means, yeah, what it has to be. And right. so yeah. thinking like, yeah, but it has to be, you yeah. know, like, uh, you know, one of my favorite movies when I growing up was a movie called Real Genius and Val Kilmer plays this brilliant guy and he... Uh, he his his roommate is this young prodigy who's like 15 mm. and the kid like starts to crack and he's like no but it you know Val Kilmer's point is like you know it, it, it it's you're going down a bad path if it's all science and no philosophy like there has to be this right. this artistic yeah. balance between yeah. the two and I think it's nice for people to hear that because mm-hmm. you know science can be incredibly creative and if someone it feels like, oh, I'm just, I feel like I'm a creative soul. That doesn't mean that you can't work in science too. Absolutely. Because now that, you know, you can bash, you don't have to, you don't have to stay in the traditional track. Having, you know, the, the training and the credentials makes you effectively like an entrepreneur if you choose to behave that way. Right. Okay. And I've selected to behave that way. And I've also selected to behave because, you know, I'll tell you something that I, this, this is like, you know, like one of the things about me coming into the world of science is I've always felt like an outsider. OK. And because of that, I've always felt like you're going to fire me tomorrow anyway. So I'm just going to do what I want to do. Right. Now, I don't mean that now that works because I actually am about the mission. Right. We're about the same mission. OK. And I've always felt that. Uh, there's a lot of constraining and there's a lot of inefficiency in the way we construct workplaces. And I'll give you an example of that, that I found science in many ways to be different because just like in what you do, the job is about getting the job done. Mm -hmm. It's not about showing up at this time and leaving at that time and letting the boss see that you're, you know, that kind of stuff that is packed with inefficiency. So now that we've had this unfortunate, tragic circumstance of this pandemic, right, I think people see now, you know, where you don't, you know, 
right now, people have moved into a work mode of getting the job done right. <laughs> rather than having to go into that commute, spend time in that place, you know, and, and that sort of thing, right? Um, and, and science, you know, just like um, science has been global going back centuries that it has existed, right? You have to talk to others. Science has been task oriented for a long time. So, you know, there's a lot that you can learn from the world of science, but the greatest thing about it is that you're the architect of it, right? You can make it what you want it to be. You don't have to look at what people, cause that's exactly, you know what? That's deeper than it sounds because when you're a graduate student becoming, you know, a graduate student life is you have an apprentice, you're, you're the apprentice of a master. That's deeper than I thought it was because one of your first jobs as a graduate student is basically there's three phases. One is, you know, taking all the academics and jumping over all the hoops to prove that you're worthy of being in the building type stuff, right? Then there's a period where you must become current. Mm -hmm. And that means learning everything everyone has ever said about your topic up to yesterday. Now you're current, okay? Now, then your final job is to make a new contribution to knowledge. Mm -hmm. So essentially what that means is, okay, here's what everybody else thinks about this and have thought about this. Now let me tell you what I think about it, right? So that's not just in studying the world. It also is about how we operate, right? And the way we interact with each other. And, you know, it's not optimized in that way. Science is clearly not optimized in that way in my field. Well, and also that idea of, you said, always feeling like an outsider, which hmm. you have used to your advantage because you, yes. because if you had, if, if you had conformed to an existing structure, it might've stifled that Absolutely. explosively creative thought and creative problem solving and being able to see above everything. <laughs> um, and so you've managed to make it work to your benefit where, you know, a lot of people who feel like outsiders might, it, they might shy away from that and go, well, I yeah. feel this feels uncomfortable. So I don't know. Right. So right. What, advi what advice do you give to those people who say, my God, I feel exactly the same way, but I don't know how to push through that. Yeah. You know, you know what it is? So it, it may not be advice. It may be embodying an attitude. Have you ever had a buddy, you know, or a person, you know, in your life and you find yourself in a situation and there's normal Chris thought. But then you're like, no, 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 I'm going to embody Agatha on this one. Right. And you just boom, right? And you handle the situation. So I'll tell you a different alternative perspective. So uh, the only reason I made uh, a career that I survived the, 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 you know, the, the process of proving myself was because when people told me that they, uh, you know, you can't do this, it's not for you, that kind of thing. My, my response was, I'll show you, mm -hmm. right? I felt offended. I felt defiant about that, right? The list, you know, it, it's something about, you know, somebody, you know, I hate hierarchy, you know? Um, I like to prove it, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, like I, you know, I went to the military first and I had a great and a horrible time in the military. It was great in many, many ways, but it was horrible in that I was always in trouble because I was so damn defiant. Because I didn't care how many stripes were on your arm. If you were going to tell me what to do, not only did your character have to be just like oh, unassailable, because, you know, I grew up in that honor, you know, world of the deep south, right? But you pretty much needed to be able to kick my ass, too. <laughs> kick my ass. <laughs> Hey, you know, that was young Hakeem, right? Very, very defiant like that. And so when people find, most people, when people are like, this isn't for you, it kills you, right? It, 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 you know, you're already doubting yourself. You're in a tough situation. And then somebody comes along and tells you this isn't for you. And what the world is, um, I think, awakening to in the current era is how different people have different experiences. And you don't know about what other people's experiences is like. You never you know. know. Well, I want to, I want to, let's shift then for a second and talk about defiance yeah. because. Yeah, absolutely. The, the idea, like when we think about how, like throughout history. Yeah. How many, uh, like the, the really a lot of the great um, discoveries that have, that have driven yeah. technology and mm -hmm. mankind forward were defiant. They were either, uh, yeah. you know, like, especially, you know, at a Galileo. time. Galileo. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> 
the defiance. Bruno, the, whatever, yeah. So, so, so the idea of, I think that is actually a really interesting mm-hmm. piece of advice for people that, that are told like, oh, well, you can't, you know, oh, I have these creative ideas and someone goes, no, it doesn't That's work right. that way. Or it's like, yeah. you know, it's sort of find that defiant part of you and go, oh, well, um, actually, I'm going to devote my time <laughs> to proving how yeah. old you are. Because a lot of times, you know, look, yeah. people love to tell you no. They love to tell you why you yeah. can't do something. They love to, yeah. they love to tell you. And so it, uh, it and, and a lot of times they just, they lack the creativity and the vision to see what you see. And so because they don't have a frame of reference for it, they just, their first response is no. And no, so exactly, go, exactly. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, well, uh, we'll see about that. Yeah. So if you look on YouTube, you'll see this talk I did at Kennedy Space Center like years ago, like 2013 or 2014. And the title of it is Believe in Yourself and Do It Anyway. And what I did is I went through all the times in my career, not all of them, but several times in my career where someone, you tell them the idea, just, just like you say it, immediately, no, you can't do that. And then what do I do? I go off and do it anyway. And then show them. Yeah. And then they're like, yeah, and you know what? <laughs> the example I gave in that talk, oh, not only do, do they like, you know, suddenly they're like part owner. <laughs> like... <laughs> It's like, yeah, look what we did, you know. <laughs> well, it's you know, it it's it's so important because there's uh it it to me it feels like, you know, even 20 years ago, things were just so limited in terms of what people had access to. And now yeah. the internet, like we 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 really <laughs> You can literally find, I mean, anything you possibly, I mean, I think about these times when I had to write papers in school and it's like, I had to go to the freaking library. Oh, the book is checked out. And I literally could yeah. not finish the report <laughs> yeah, because the one yeah. goddamn book that I needed, someone yeah. else had, and that was it. There was That's no it. way. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Like being a, a physics graduate student, one of the skills was, find a similar problem in a book, right? In the the physics library. And we would comb through those books and you got to know those books. You got to know like, oh, I saw a problem like this in Landau and Lipschitz. You know, you you know, that's the, uh, yeah, yeah, physics theory. Right, exactly. And and, and so, you know, that's, you know, having it at your fingertips instantly, all of human knowledge, like, you know, when I tell you the other thing, what this creator culture has created is, it really has, it says something about the gatekeepers, you know, and when you say it earlier, oh, a lot of people love to tell you no, you know, I thought about myself as a mentor, okay, and I like to be encouraging, but at the same time, tough, right, and uh, so I'll tell you things I do, like one example is, when I get new, at the beginning of every year, when I have new researchers, I'll ask the group, what is the, what? is the purpose of science. <laughs> <laughs> and they give these answers, you know, oh, to improve human life, to you know, like understand the universe. And I'll say, no. The purpose of science is to make a plot. So if you don't come in here every week with a plot, I don't know you did any work. Because it's so hard for, for students to get traction in research because it's not something that you know what to do at every moment, right? You have to be a self-starter. You have to have initiative. And almost no matter what you do, it ends up in a plot. (laughs) And so because students have so much trouble getting started, they do activities that aren't the actual activities where the rubber meets the road. They'll tell you I'm reading and I'm, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Right. So, uh, the, the, the point is, is the reason of the plot is, you know, I'm I'm actually here to get work out. And if you're not going to be a self starter, then you're going to have to go, you know, that's, that's, that's it. Um, but if you're going to stay here, I don't care where your starting place is. I got you. And we're, you're, you're, you know, we're about to do this together. All you got to do is have the initiative to try and want to go. And so the best students of my life, man, there are so many students. And I'm talking small statistics, not a thousand, right? That have gone on to do so well that we're straight up C students and are now like, like I have one student that's flown three rockets that works at NASA, you know. You know, yeah, yeah. And this dude was a straight up C student. And in fact, he pursued me for a year before I accepted him in touch to my group, not because he was a C student, but because he looked so tough, I was scared of him. I was like, dude, you're not killing me. You're not coming up to my research group. 
<laughs> he had a scar. His, you know, he was a hockey player, right? But he's the sweetest guy in the world, right? Uh, uh, and a br- brilliant guy. But you know, sometimes you don't cause traction because there's also a, a, a culture within scientific communities, right? And so nerves come in different shapes, sizes, forms. And, you know, sometimes people can be clicky, especially when you're young, right? You know, everybody's not encouraging. So I try to be a not, and I know a lot of other people that try to be encouraging to the people around us. This idea of encouraging your students to come in with uh, a story, come in with like like motivation is is also, they're part of the training because that's what they're going to need I would imagine like once they become, you know, like fully oh, yeah. fledged grown up scientists. Absolutely. What Absolutely. is the, earlier you had said like, you know, even like getting the place where you could, was it get published or like, or, or to, or, or to contribute, you, you had to get to like, what is the process? Yeah. Like if you have, right. if you have that research, you go, Oh my God, I have yeah. this amazing research. I really feel yeah. like I'm onto something the world hasn't seen right. before. What happens then? What do you do with right. that? Exactly. So for the standard scientist, this is the standard, right? There's the first thing are the federal agencies that fund science. And every year they have their priorities and they put out a list every year of what they're going to fund, right? Like, like, you know, submit proposals for, you know, astrophysics data analysis. We have a pot of money that's 2 million. We plan to give out 20, you know, something along that line, roughly. Um, and you, and let me tell you, so here's what, remember that process I told you about, about becoming current where you read everything that's in your field. Yeah. So think about this. Uh, when I was coming up, there were 3000 astronomers in America. Okay. 3000. Now, once you divide them up by communities, solar physicists, neutron stars, white dwarfs, uh, you know, the galaxy people, the, the, the planetary people. The interstellar medium people, the, you know, gas cloud people, right? You know, you're talking about a small number of people per field, really, mm-hmm. right? So everybody knows you. So when I was doing that get current thing, you start seeing certain names show up over and over and you realize these are the heavy hitters in that field. So what I would do at that time is, okay, I'm going to get every paper that person read, wrote and read them, right? So I know what all these important, you know, the people that are leading the ideas think about things. Then you become a scientist. And this is my experience. So I, I get invited to be on a NASA proposal evaluation committee. And I get these <laughs> proposals. Now, I had already submitted proposals as a professor, as a single principal investigator. Okay. Man, I get into these proposal evaluation committee and I see that several of these cats who are giants write their proposals together. And there are several of those in there. So in this pile of proposals, it's all my idols and I'm in there. <laughs> and you're like, it's like, you know, I'm going to submit a proposal for basketball. And, you know, I've studied LeBron, I've studied Jordan, I've studied Kareem, I've studied Wilt. And then you enter a competition and realize, oh, I'm going up against LeBron, Jordan, <laughs> <laughs> Wilt, you know, yeah. And man, you're just like, wow, you know, this is so, this is so tough. And, you know, so if you're a beginner, they take a little pity on you, right? They take a little pity on you. They'll say, oh, look, that person worked. And this is considered a bias now. Oh, this person worked for a top person in this particular field. So that means they're well-trained. Their other students did well. So maybe we'll help them out a little bit in some way, right? You know, and, and, and so, you know, they don't just kick you to the curb. They try to help if you're not in the, the if you're not in the group of people that get funded, the reviewers have a responsibility to help you, right? By in the feedback they give you. Right. And then the some do, some don't, because the reviewers are your competitors, right? But the agencies certainly try to help you along. Now here's a clear thing. When I got my first faculty position, it was joint with NASA uh Marshall Space Flight Center and the University of Alabama in Huntsville, okay? okay? Now, Saul Perlmutter, who would win the Nobel Prize in physics five years later, was a pal, right? And he said to me, he goes, Hakeem, let me tell you something, man. Getting these proposals funded is very difficult, but here's what the research has shown, and I don't know if that's cur- true today. People think that there is a bias toward the top universities, 
But what the research has shown is that the professors at the top universities assume they're going to get eventually funded. So they pr submit this proposal year after year after year after year. But the professors at the medium and smaller you know, uh, level universities, after it doesn't get funded for a couple of years, you stop proposing it, right? And having gone through that myself, right? I'm, you know, I, I finished school in 1999, right? I'm 20 years on. Uh, it's, it, I, I see what he means because, you know, when you're at a top tier place, you teach only one class. We're in a lower case like mine. I was teaching two and a half classes per semester. Then you have to be on all these faculty committees. Then you want to keep a presence in the fields in which you work, right? Typically it's one, but I worked in two, right? So you're, you know, you're flying around the world. You know, and so it becomes such this giant burden to maintain your research career unless you're in one of those two cities that we alluded to earlier, right? Unless you're in a center, uh, because there you have so many resources and then your students are the top young researchers from around the world, right? So it's really, you know, and so that's why it's really important. If you look at these agencies, like the National Science Foundation runs all of our national observatories. And in order for them to decommission one, they have to, at least the rule used to be, it may still be, I assume it's still the case, that to decommission observatory, you have to return the site to its natural state. So for some observatories, it becomes cheaper to keep them than to decommission them. And so now you have all your money getting taken up by observatories that are not doing much, but the same money of the National Science Foundation is what's funding graduate student salaries all around the country, professor salaries all around the country, all these ideas. And, you know, that pot is shrinking, 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 shrinking. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, man. It's just like, yeah. you just don't, it's just, everything has some crazy process where you just, yeah. it's where, you know, you go, oh, well, why, why isn't, why isn't this simple? Why isn't X, mm -hmm. why doesn't X equal X? <laughs> it's like, well, because... <laughs> In this particular case, X is Y, and there's like a whole bunch of shit in between those two things. And there's not, I mean, there's no like, everything yeah. has some sort of a crazy process, and it's never no. simple. And it seems like, oh, I just want to make science. I just want to make the world a better place. It's like, okay, yeah. but you're going to have to learn to do all this other shit that you never figured yeah. out you'd have to do just yeah. to do science. Yeah. You know, man, I just think about if we were able to just remove, I, I so believe in humanity. And our, I mean, it's proven to me, right? It's been proven to me what humans are and what humans are capable of and what they can do, especially when we work together. But, you know, there's grit in the gears. And so I always imagine, you know, just something as simple as trust. If we were trusting and trustworthy, right, we could be Star Trek tomorrow. <laughs> it, it was just that one change, you know, but, right? Because think about all the regulations that are in place <laughs> that you have to go through all these hoops and spend so much time doing so much. And then you're looking over your shoulder and then, then you know, go to a, uh, anything with colleagues, you know, you're, you're kind of like playing the role because it's more about rather than just being yourself and everybody right. enjoying themselves. You don't want to mess up. This is work. You know, you know, you know right. yeah. and yeah. also no dilithium <laughs> crystal yet. We have not figured out, lithium crystals yet man hey but we're figuring out warp drive slowly but surely we're how close are we really to warp drive honestly very very far away in terms of engineering it right so there's a difference between you know engineering is a is a is an issue of time and money do we have the but equations once you work out the physics the equations are there uh the equations are there right but you know other elements of it aren't so the first one was the uh, uh cubier white drive which requires this, um, you know, strange matter that has a negative energy so you can expand space, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there's another that, and the reason why it's Alcubierre White is because when it was first thought of, it required so much energy based on some configuration things, some geometrical things. Then White figured out how to um, change things such that the energy requirement became, you know, not, you need the planet Jupiter, Converted into energy type, you know. Right. You know, yeah. It was reduced to like you need a mountain, you know, something like that. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but you know, that order of magnitude of change. Um, and so now there's a new idea that I just saw some headline about, and I haven't evaluated it to see if it's, uh, but it looked like it was from a a reasonable source. 
um, that suggested that there is now another new breakthrough. But it's still, you know, oh, it's a breakthrough. It's moved the problem forward. But, you know, we're still very, very, very far away. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you think of little things like how do you store antimatter? Right. Uh, if you're going to have antimatter, antimatter conversion chamber like Star Trek does. Right. Like, how do you store antimatter? And so, one, you know, most of the time people think of storing a lot of antimatter. Then I was working, you know, I, I was uh, talking to a scientist where they were making like a bunch of tiny little channels. So instead of having one big chunk of antimatter, you have little tiny, you know, uh, amounts of antimatter that, that are much easier to control at a time. You know, this is why this is part of the reason why this shit is so difficult. And it reminds me of why like when I read uh, uh, that book. Oh, my God. The book's probably 30 years, almost 30 years old now. But I think it was um, uh, Leon. Um, he wrote The God Particle. Uh, oh, yeah. Leon Letterman. Leon Letterman. Yeah. Oh, I got a great Leon Letterman story. <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear it. Uh, yeah. But he but it was just the idea of like it was such a hard book for me to get through because it was yeah. literally concepts that I had nothing to analogize. Like I couldn't, ah. there was nothing like they were such yeah. saying like these quantum ideas of like, I don't even know what to compare. I don't have anything in my head that has yeah. an analogous experience yeah. or thing to, so I just kept reading and I also, and I know that they're just with that, like a, I guess potentially discovered a fifth fundamental force or something. And so, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's something potentially that looks really serious, right? But the thing about particle physics, man, is that they have this history of, you know, their statistical requirement for discovery is pretty stringent. You know, if you state it in nerd language, five sigma, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, that's pretty stringent. But if you're not a nerd, like, what, what does that mean? But it's stringent. Take my word for it. And so they're like four sigma. And so they have a history of signals appearing that then disappear, right? Because you add more data to get it to five sigma and, uh, you know, and then it disappears because somehow, you know, basically think about it like this. A lot of science has to do with signal to noise ratio. So if the noise and the signal are like, you know, at the same size, yeah. right? You don't see the signal and the noise. But the difference between the signal and the noise is that the signal is random okay. and the noise is not. So if you start adding up a bunch of measurements, right, then for the noise, at one point at a particular slot in your spectrum, it may be up. The next point, it may be down, right? So noise can cancel itself out as you add more and more. But noise always adds, adds, adds. I mean, signal. Signal is only adds. Noise subtracts sometimes. So as you add up more uh, measurements, your signal to noise ratio starts to grow. And so sometimes what appears to be a signal can disappear. Oh, my God. Oh, Yeah. And that's that happened great. even recently. Like after they found the Higgs, they thought they had found another particle, but then it disappeared. So After does that mean that it's not there or that it just, that just because they can't really confirm it at that level of uh, signal to noise ratio that yeah. they go, well, it could be there, but we're not seeing it now. So we have to assume it's not there. Sometimes that is the case. Sometimes that is the case, but most of the time it's not there. So, uh, so what's your Leon Letterman story? Oh man, this is so hilarious. So, um, you know, I did summer research at the university of, California and Berkeley okay. prior to uh, going to graduate school. And I got to know the folks at a place, you know, at a center in the physics department called the Center for Particle Astrophysics. So they ended up getting a grant the next year called Bringing the Scientific Culture in Balance. And it was about, you know, the long work hours, how people treat each other, all of this. And, you know, they had a little section, you know, to, to, to put it in today's terminology, it was in 1992 and it was kind of woke, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so what they did is the idea of the, of the conference was that we would strip away all hierarchy and titles. So no one knows who anyone is. Right. And we will place you at a table and you and your group of 10 will work together for an entire week and you'll come to know each other. So I was at the table with Leon Letterman. OK, so the people who were senior, they could, you know, by, the, by lunch, you knew who they were and what they did. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right. 
but anyway, here I am, a first year grad student, just completed my first year, right out of Mississippi, right? Not the dude, you know, like, you know, like my speech was different, right? And people couldn't understand me when I spoke when I first arrived on the West Coast from Mississippi. And I had to learn to hit my consonants and add the ends to the words and not draw out everything, right? Um, even though certain words like head, leg, I still, <laughs> I still draw out. Uh, but anyway, you know, it ended up being very touchy, feely, emotional. And at the end, Leon, the other, uh, you know, and I was a speaker, uh, and Leon, the others were like, oh, hug me. Oh, we, we love you so much. Oh, Hakeem, it was such a delight <laughs> to meet you. So I go to my second year of grad school, and Leon comes as a colloquium speaker, right? And so we have this thing where you have donuts and tea and coffee before an hour with the speaker before they speak. So he was there, and of course he was sworn because he had just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, so I waited until everybody left him alone just so we were about to go in. And I was like, hey, Leon, it's me. He was like, who? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and I was like, oh, you know, we hugged, Leon. <laughs> I know. And it, and it probably wasn't that he, on some level, didn't remember. It's just that guy. No, he didn't remember. He had probably, he didn't remember. He'd probably met 10,000 people. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm forgiving for stuff like that, man. I don't, I don't hold that a grudge. Because you know what? It's, you know, I'm nowhere near as well known as you. But I've seen things on the internet where, um, you know, how, you know, if I, I go give a speech, there's a line of people talking to you, you know, someone will say like, oh, yeah, I shook his hand, but we didn't, he didn't talk to me and they were kind of hurt. You guys, you you guys know, had act, an actual moment where it's like, yeah. oh, my God, this guy, I think he's my uncle now. And then it was. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What was exactly. The, uh, <laughs> when? No, uh, Leon, yeah, yeah, why? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, like I said, man, I'm really forgiving. I'm really forgiving with that. But, you know, I know that some people aren't. You know, and so I, I try to the extent that people think I'm a nice guy that needs to be, you know, hi, I'm happy to see you. Let's take a selfie. You know, if I'm not doing anything, um, oh, sure, let's do it. But, you know, you know, like I say, I don't know what your life is like, man. I can't imagine. And, and I might find out soon, but I can't imagine for people like these big stars what their life is like, you know, to, to not be able to go outside. <laughs> well, I mean, I, well, actually, that's just been the whole last year. The whole last year is, you know, <laughs> don't, don't, don't go out, don't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. Uh, but you know, and now, I'm an introvert. That's too much for me. <laughs> I feel like social media changed everything, though, because now everyone is famous in a weird way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Known, you're absolutely right. Everyone's yeah. famous. Like, that's a whole. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's almost yeah, but like, people don't bother you, man. Because I spent one day with Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. You know? And I got to experience the, that insanity of crowds and paparazzi and all that's that. a whole nother level. Yeah, that's a whole yeah. nother level. Uh, and yeah, and, yeah. And, stress and and yeah, God, it's so it's so great that you got to. I mean, it, yeah, he, was he going to produce? Did I read that he was going to produce yeah. something around your book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, so yeah, so like the summer of uh, twenty eighteen, I think it was. Um, <laughs> I went there. And we met uh, and we had this meeting and it was just like when I met you, you know, in, in the sense of the vibing of it, you know, like, I, you know, like when I met you, dude, like the way I vibed with you, like, I mean, that's what you do. I guess you vibe like you, you're probably one of those people that everybody thinks you're their best friend. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I definitely I definitely feel like I connect with people a lot on the podcast, yeah. but, but I definitely right. have. But there are definitely people who come on where I'm like, fuck, because I, I know I'm going to be friends with that person as opposed yeah. to I can connect with someone. But then I also on some level know like, well, it's likely I might never run into. I will probably never talk. Yeah, to, right. You know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, but yeah. definitely with you, it just sort of felt like I feel like we're going to be friends, you know, like. And, yeah, man. And, and I wonder that I wonder that about you. too. like, oh, is he just such a oh. cool guy that, that everyone thinks they're friends with him? I don't know. No, dude. I felt like I, I know you already. That's the crazy thing about it. I felt, you know, it was so everything so natural. It's like I was like my homies. But anyway, uh, so we have this meeting that's supposed to be an hour to discuss whether or not we can work together. And Chad, mine just starts going. And we're in a, a little uh, diner type deal. And he's pulling over like pl paper uh, placemats and like sketching out ideas and things. I'm just like, I had no idea that this dude was brilliant. Like, you know, brilliant actor, you know, versus the creative, seeing the creative process. Right. right? Yeah. And so then, you know, his business partner, Logan Coles, who's also amazing. He says to Chad, Chad, you got to get out of here, man. 
So what was happening was it was May. That's what it was. He was um, Infinity War was about to come out. And he's like, hey, man, I got to go do this thing for Infinity War. You want to come with me? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I've heard of uh, it. Let me think about that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, it was at the El Capitan Theater. Right. Um, and it was a, and, and so what happened is, you know, we had a long drive in the car together. Um, and, you know, I picked his brain and he was so gracious. And then, you know, I went through the whole like process of the event with him. And then we had a long drive back and he dropped me off. And I was like, did that just happen? You know, just flabbergasted. Um, and I tell you, you know, it's funny because, you know, I was like, by the end of the con, the end of the thing, I was like, man, I must work with you. And Chad was like, hey, 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 hey. you got to do what's best for you, man. You know, he was like, slow up, dude. You know, do what's best for you. You know, talk to your agent, talk to your, you know, don't be jumping the gun, you know, think everything through. But then that's what ended up happening. And so the thing about that was, here, let me tell you something. So I asked him a couple of questions and he said to me, I had never told anybody this, but I'll tell you now. And then later he told me, he told these stories in public, okay? And one of them was a story of his first acting job and how his character was so one dimensional. You know, the black kid who's angry at the world, parents are in prison or on drugs, sort of thing, right? Um, and he told me how he'd always wanted, you know, because here's the, 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 the reality of uh, life when you're like an African-American who's lived, especially if you've lived in the deep South where you just have like vast communities, right? Is that you see the, you know, everyday peopleness of it, right? The full spectrum of humanity. And you see how talented so many people are. And you see how these stories just aren't told, right? You have a stereotype of your community. And all of this stuff isn't there, you know? And so people see a symbol, right? And so for, in America, brown skin is a symbol. Um, and and they, they immediately prejudge the person based on the fact that they just haven't had time with these people. And so anyway, Chad wanted characters that had depth and reality, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what he saw in my story. And he, like, championed it, man. Like, he... You know, like, I, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't know he was ill. And we had several meetings as we talked about the script and things. And there were things happening. And I, I attributed to his stardom, you know. Uh, but then in the aftermath, when I found out, then I was like, oh, everything makes sense now. Uh, but man, to know, because there were times when I was talking to him and Logan, and they were like making that movie 18 Bridges. And these cats were doing these crazy long hours on that movie. And at the same time, working on this project, right? right. And that he was going through what he was going through. It's, like, it's utterly, it's, it's so unbelievably heartbreaking. And it killed, like, oh. that was one of those, when they announced that he had passed, it was like, what the fuck? Like, he Dude. had what? I mean, he, and, and just to your earlier point about you never know what people are going through. You never yeah. know what people are going through. And I mean, he, it is utterly simultaneously heartbreaking and mind blowing yeah. that he was still doing all of these things yeah. and like, and kept it to himself because that's what he wanted no. to do. And that was his choice. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, and, and I, we just, you know, we watched um, our, our fr um, uh, my friend Coleman Domingo was in Ma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which is a phenomenal movie. Oh, man. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He's amazing. Everyone's amazing. And Viola yeah, Davis is yeah. incredible. Yeah, and Chad. absolutely. And to watch that movie and go, and go, he was, he's giving this unbelievable performance that requires, and these are long scenes. And he has a lot of, like, there's scenes where he has a lot of, yeah. like, very energetic dialogue. And it's like, yeah. how? How in how, how in, yeah. in the name of anything is he doing this? It, it's, right. it's it's superhuman, dude. Super superhuman, and and he gave a superhuman effort to pitch in this book of mine, right? And this character and these characters. And not only did he do that, but he was insisting because you know my life story takes place in some black communities that are pretty, uh, you know, they have history and they have a particular style to them. Deep Woods, Mississippi, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Houston, right? Um, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. 
And he, you know, we'd go back and forth about the script and he wasn't having it. He, he, he got it where he had last words on making sure that the script, because he wanted to make sure that, that the reality of the black community of America was shown in all these, di- all this different color and depth that it actually exists, not this one dimensional portrait. And the main character, which was myself, you know, typically, you know, I, I, I really like, I divulge a bit when I talk to you, man, but I, you know, there was no way I was going to divulge the true horror and everything I've been through in my life. Right. And everything I've done, I wasn't going to, uh, I, you know, it took me until now to come to a place where I could, and it's in, it's in that book, you know, and even now I'm like scared out of my mind, <laughs> you know, because people know me as this light, happy go lucky, smart, really nice guy. Right. And then when you see, well, guess what? You know, <laughs> minister society became black Panther, you know, that's kind of, uh, it, you know, it, 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 you know, he loved the fact that, you know, it wasn't the, the, the win isn't the guy survived. Right. Or, you know, because that's typically it. If you look at those movies of coming of age, black guys who uh, are, you know, delve into crime and these sort of things, you know, the, the, the win is that they survive. Or you have like a hidden figures type characters where their parents protect them from everything. And, you know, and they have they're like, oh, really, really goody, goody. You know, uh, uh, you know, it's not full of crime and all this kind of stuff, you know. So now imagine a life with all of that. Uh, now you have a fully developed character that you could, you know, as a creator, you could really go to town with. And Chad was fighting for that to make sure that it made. Oh, absolutely. And so where, where is that? Where is it at now? So uh, that's the question. So it, 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 so it got picked up immediately. Universal picked it up immediately on the first pitch. Right. So everybody, you know, as a guy who's new to all this, Everybody's telling me, dude, it takes forever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> everybody was always like, you know, nobody's going to want you. I mean, not exactly. Right. But, you know, they don't want to get your hopes up. And, 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 and right. And so um, we got it sold in the pandemic hit. And now the studios have to figure out what their model is. So when this movie was taken up, the way it was explained to me, and I am by me, you know, I am no expert on the biz- the movie business. Is that the uh, and this is this was like you know from an agent or somebody I don't remember is that the studios you know they're in business to make money but they're also a part of an artistic enterprise so they make two types of movies some movies that are like you know the money makers and then other movies that are like you know they want to make a real movie and maybe even an Oscar contender and so my movie was thought of uh, you know according to the person who was speaking to me as the latter with the potential to make a lot of money, but you know, it's not, you know, it, it, if you don't have a Marvel universe, you know, then it's, that, that may limit it, who knows? Um, but the problem that with my story is just that it's such a, you know, the ball, like, man, when I submitted the manuscript, I basically had to cut out, I had to cut it. I submitted it at 147,000 words. I had oh, to cut out 47,000 of them. Well, what's 147 minus, 97 it's now 97,000 words right so so many stories that you know that kill kill your little darlings phrase <laughs> right right yeah, they're gone yeah yeah. Well, that, yeah the idea about about how much the film business has changed and who yeah. even knows what it is anymore and then in, within the last couple of days when the last two days or three days they announced like oh the biggest theater chain just shut down in los angeles really? i didn't see that Oh the Cinema theaters, goodness. the Cinerama Dome. So it's like, what are movies anymore? And, you right. know, film, film studios are experimenting with like, well, maybe we just release stuff on the over-the-top yeah. home services. And maybe there's, yeah. a, you know, I personally believe that the theater experience will come back because it's yeah. just so integral that because, again, it's, yes, convenience is great. It's great to see stuff in your home. But we as human beings crave community yeah. and we crave experience. And you yeah. don't get that when you're watching stuff at home. Like, yeah. The idea, like when it's when it's safe, to, fully safe to go back into a theater full of people and see a movie yeah. again. Like I yeah. don't know how people aren't going to like trip over themselves to do that. So, oh my man, even though it man. seems a little like uh, uh, what's going on right now, I do believe right, that it'll right. come back. And so, yeah. I really hope that I hope yeah. that your um, uh, I, I, I hope that your movie uh, has a chance to to get made. Yeah, so do I, man. So do I. So we'll find out uh, in the next 
you know, several months by, by the fall, because there's an option, you know, uh, in the contract and, uh, we'll, you know, we'll find out, we'll see. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I feel really good about it as the reviews have come in, um, for everything, everybody's really blown away because, you know, it, you know, I just did the audio book this week and it was the first time I just went through the final, cause you know, when you're editing over and over and over and over again, you're doing it in chunks and pieces. Right. And this is the first time I went through cover to cover the actual final product. Mm-hmm. Man. Whew. Yeah. It, it's a journey. It's a, it's like, yeah. It, you know, and, and I had the same experience that uh, I got a great blurb from Bill Nye, but everybody's pretty much saying the same thing. I can't wait to see what happens next. Like, holy cow, I can't put this thing down because we all know I end up as an astrophysicist. But as you reach, like, how, how, possibly you know <laughs> can, can you get out of this thing well and also and also i imagine the experience of you reading the book as a, you know as a you know as a third person basically you're reading the yeah. story and of course the story is you but you're re- you're reading it from a different perspective did you have the experience yeah. of like how how did this guy survive like how you know absolutely absolutely and i'll tell you this so i I'm, I'm actually a trained voice actor right i took you know years of classes and, and uh, did a lot of commercial work when I lived in the Bay Area. Uh, my main, uh, believe it or not, my main client was MTV. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I did a ton of voice work for MTV back in the like 2000, 2001, 2002. Yeah. Can I just tell you that the reason yeah. that Lights Me is number one, I used to work at MTV. And also, no way. yes, wow. I, I hosted a show yeah. in my first job and I hosted shows on MTV. But also, <laughs> It delights me to no end that the iconic MTV logo was the rocket taking off and the guy and the and the moon the moonwalk. That's so right. Know that they had an actual wow. astrophysicist <laughs> yeah. doing voiceovers yeah. for MTV. Elevate, yeah, elevate yeah. that whole narrative a thousand. Absolutely. Fold. Hey, do you remember MTV's online radio uh, Sonic Net by any chance? I do actually. Dude, I did station identifications for three of the Sonic Net stations. So oh I get in there one day. So, you know, with voice acting, you typically have an engineer and a director. So I yeah. show up this one day and there's no director. And the engineer is like, okay, how can you go? Right? So I'm like, and, you know, I'm a young voice actor. And so that's like, whoa, go. And she's like, so here's our direction. She goes, all right, Hakeem, this is our tongue in your ear late night R&B station. It's called Down Low. Okay, <laughs> dude. <laughs> oh man, the, the the scripts were like this: down low, the perfect. <laughs> and then the female voice comes in, the perfect blend. And then I go down low. <laughs> She's <Wow>. like downrageous. <laughs> oh, and so and, and during yeah. this time, you already have your PhD at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's for my creative. So you know, I, I was I was always a creative person, man. I was always a, um, and I put I had to get this in the book, right? So I had to fight everybody from my agent to the editor. I'm like, we must include this, um, because it was such a huge important part of my life was music. Uh, I was a musician, and what happened in my life is that uh, you know, all like all of the, the middle school boys got to go off of football, right? And that's your last two periods of middle school every day. But instead of going out for football, I was trying to do gangster stuff. <laughs> okay. So the vice principal catches me and he takes me to the band director. Because these two dudes are the two known disciplinarians. And he's like, you know, put this boy to good use. And I catch on so quick. The band director is like, yo, you want to play in the high school marching band? So I'm like the only uh, middle schooler in the high school marching band. And so by the time I'm a sophomore, I'm like literally uh, arranging scores for the band and choreographing halftime shows so we can match the HBCU Black College Band. What right? are you playing? What what do you what instrument? I play the tuba. Amazing. You know. Yeah, I, you want to go ahead. What, I'm no. about to really blow your mind next. You have to. So if you Google Stanford tubas, you'll see that all the tubas they have the uh, sousaphones properly, right? They have the white fiberglass ones. And they all have a painting in the bell. So when I joined the Stanford Band in 1992, they handed me a blank tuba bell. And they said, paint your bell. And I said, what can I paint? And they said, whatever you want. And I said, 
whatever I want? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, whatever you want. So now Google Stanford tuba weed. <laughs> so that has now become the most famous tuba in the Stanford band. When you see that, I painted that in 1992. I painted that leaf. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think, you know, one of the many reasons why, first of all, I love talking to you and also just why I admire you so much is because the example that you set, again, not even just talking about like, oh, you don't, science doesn't have to just be one thing, but yeah. you also, you just do so many, like, it, it's just the lesson of like, follow the things that are interesting to you. Yeah. And, you know, even if it doesn't seem like on paper, they necessarily connect. Like, how does the right. tube connect to science? I don't know how it connects. You know how it connects? Because <laughs> you, you are the connected yeah. to yeah. you. As, and, a, as a being, you, Hakeem, are the connected yeah, exactly. tissue, and you're what right. makes that whole story make sense together. Yeah. And I think and that's you know so inspiring for anybody. Absolutely, man. It is. And you know what's really crazy about this is that, you know, so I, I wrote the book with a, with a guy who was, who was amazing, Joshua Horowitz. And I would tell him all these anecdotes that are not in the book, right? So one of the people, I, and so I would talk to him about this guy who was my tuba idol, all right? His name was Howard Johnson, the, like the hotel chain. And so there's actually a um, organization called the T-U-B-A, Tubus Universal Brotherhood Association. So I mean, I, it's I, a fantastic acronym. Right? So I was a member, and I, you know, and... I used to love Howard Johnson. Dude, he died like last month or something like oh, that. It was wow. all, and it was on the news. And I was like, whoa. I was so, I, you know, I was, I was literally, because of the book, I was planning to look him up. And, it, and he pops up on the news. And I had just told Josh this story about Howard Johnson. And I was just like, wow, that is nuts how the universe works. So we're in the matrix, Chris. That's what this means. <laughs> and also, you just said how the universe works. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you you. That, that. that was an that was the an ex, the accidentally best segue in the oh, universe. I, you mean smoothest? Are you right? <laughs> I'm sorry. What I <laughs> so let me tell you how science works. Remember that, pro that that process we told you earlier. Let me tell you how the universe works. Remember that process we talked about earlier about proposals. Yes. Now let's talk about what happens once you get your money. Right. You yes. start doing your research. And you propose what you were planning to do, and this is what needs to be done, right? Because you're doing fundamental research, you always find something, but rarely is it what you thought you were going to find, right? You right. find something, yeah, but then you write it like that's what you always intended to do. So, yeah, my accidents, yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to do. But that's a, that's a great life lesson, too, because there there is an analogous thing in comedy where you think you write the perfect joke and you do it on stage and it and it doesn't work. And then you just make an aside comment in reaction on stage how it didn't work. And then that kills. And you're like, yeah. really? Like you never, you know, it's like, but it, it, it's the, it's the idea of like not being too rigid about yeah. not being yeah. too rigid about yeah. the outcomes or the results and sort of saying like, well, this is what I, this is where I think I'm going, but I need to be open enough to, yeah. to see like what materializes and not be too married to my ego. Yeah. That, no, but it has to be this thing. Like that's right. No, that's right. Yeah. No, you can it imagine. Doesn't, it doesn't survive at that fifth yeah. level where all the signal yeah. and the noise ratio it didn't survive. It disappeared. Right. You know, I can see the cartoon of what you just described. Like the rigid road and all these roads of opportunity going off on the side. You but then to you're sticking to the rigid road. You just have to see yeah. them. So is yeah. just in terms of like how the universe works. Yeah. Just in terms so how the universe works, yes. But first, yeah. I just quickly because we touch upon it really briefly about yeah. uh, Curiosity Rover and the yeah. and um uh and then and then we'll get into the to how the universe yeah, then, yeah. and then we'll solve how the universe works before you know as we wrap it up but um uh so i i you know i see the news reports every day i see nasa on instagram i see yeah. like oh there's these yeah. blue sand dunes and you know there's yeah. water and there's and the helicopter's gonna go and there so like what 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 to you has been the most surprising um revelation from curiosity so far like what have you seen where you were like holy shit i thought it, like we were just talking about i thought yeah. it was going to be this but it's actually this well you know what man it's the one that compelled me to write an article about it um and so you know i i i don't you know i don't you know i don't public a lot 
you know, I work a lot, but I don't like put stuff out a lot. Right. Uh, because I'm working a lot. Right. right. Um, and so I started a medium. And I wrote this article, So There's Methane on Mars, because I found that to be incredibly intriguing. And the reason why is because methane breaks down naturally in a few hundred years. So if it's existing, if we're seeing these puffs of methane on Mars, <gasps> either, you know, and so there are two ways that methane comes into existence. One is called abiotic, it's geological processes that require water. And then there are the biological met waves. Martian so, farts. Exactly. Exactly. Mundo. So it could be fossilized farts that are escaping, you know, from the ground. And that's fine because where there's a fart, there is a butt, right? Which means life. I mean, so, I, I don't know why we don't pause all this right now, put that on a t-shirt and become billionaires. Where there's a <laughs> fart, there's a butt. The hashtag Mars. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's right. Listen, man. Look, look, you know, that's how it flows. So, hey, I'll give you one. Name the six simple machines, Chris Hardwick, sir. Oh, man. Why are you taking you can't that? Do to... it. You can't do it. But I know there's listen. a lever and there's a... Fucking... You know what? I came up with something. I came up with something recently. What? Lips dub dub. Okay. Lips dub dub. Lever, inclined plane, pulley, screw, Dub one, wedge. Dub two, wheel and axle. So now just think lips dub dub. Unless you want to think lift dub dub or slip dub dub. But whatever, it's lips dub dub. <laughs> I like that because it starts with the one that I could remember, which was the lever. So the, yeah, the yeah. so there's methane on Mars, which means that it had yeah. to come from somewhere. And so we just don't know. Well, we just don't know. But that's the most intriguing sign for potential life so far. Because it, it's it's intermittent, it comes and it goes. So there's a background level of, of 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 methane that's really low. But then we have the Mars Observer, which is all which can also measure methane. And so at the time I wrote the article, there was a there was a um, conflict, a bit of a conflict in their results. But now that we have uh, you know a more advanced rover on Mars, uh, who knows, right? If, if we'll see, if we see methane again, man, that that would just be great. So as the, as the next season of how the universe works, yeah. uh, what, what are you, what other, what other processes in the universe uh, are you going to talk about? What, what are we going to learn this season? Man, there's so much. So a lot of people, you know, so we've talked, you know, so, listen, we're learning so much about things like even the sun, the, 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 the Parker solar probe discovered this, uh, phenomenon called switchbacks where basically nobody saw it coming like we you know people who study the sun there are these two big problems that we all have to that we all think about one of them is the fact that the surface of the sun is around six thousand degrees kelvin but it has this atmosphere above the surface that's kept at millions of degrees indefinitely right now that appears to violate the laws of thermodynamics and then the second thing is the sun has incredibly strong gravity, <laughs> as you can imagine. Right. But yet, its atmosphere streams away into, into outer space, forming the solar wind, right? So there must be an incredible force, right, driving this material out of the sun's uh, gravitational potential well. So, you know, we had all these processes on magnetic fields. One thing we didn't think was that they were just like on this. On, on the surface of the sun, just like, flip, flip. <laughs> you know, like these things are like millions of miles. You know, how do you flip when you're millions of miles? And they do. And that's the pro. And so do we know for sure yeah. that that's what's happening? Yeah, we know for sure that's what's happening. It's like this new thing, you know, that everybody's like now trying to study. Uh, and, 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 you know, we have dragonfly that's going to go on to, uh, when I say we, I mean humanity. Right. right. Um, I'm not saying I am a member of NASA. I no longer am. And because I used to speak for NASA and also speak in the media, I had to always make it clear when I'm speaking for NASA, when I'm not. Right. right. I am not. I'm speaking to Saki. Right. Um, and so when I say we, America and humanity, right, Dragonfly is going to land on Titan and fly. And, it, and, and, you know, there's the other body in our solar system with surface liquids. Right. So that is incredibly exciting to me. 
Um, and then, you know, we talk about water worlds and exoplanets, but we have them in our own solar system, right? Um, and you have like Enceladus and Europa with water subsurface. Um, and we have Titan. So those are my like three favorite places. And then Mars would be number four for me, right? Got it. And, yeah. uh, and do you think that how long, first of all, how long is the, how long is the season? Is it like eight episodes, 10 episodes? Yeah, it's typically somewhere between eight and 12. I don't know the number right off the top of my head, but you know, we, we do, we, we cover such a broad range from exoplanets to the weird things in the universe, the universe itself, right? Things like black holes, things like white holes. And you know, we, I'll tell you some things, man, that are really cool that, you know, people don't know unless you're like really into it. Like, man, people will, all, if you do a naive calculation about the size of the universe, right? Naively, you'll think, oh, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So the radius of the universe is 13.8 billion light years, right? But, uh, and then you calculate how much mass is within that volume. You will come to the conclusion that, oh, maybe the universe is a black hole. But then once you realize how the expansion of the universe you know, makes your naive model way incorrect, you realize the, the, black, the universe is not a black hole. But then you think about it more and you realize, huh, the universe is actually a reverse black hole. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, imagine. So you think about a, a, a black hole as a spherical thing where everything's getting sucked into it. Right, now, imagine it's so just condensed at such an incredible amount of force. Yeah, well, basically the curvature of, so if you think about space-time, it compels you to move in directions, right? That's what falling is. You're moving along this inertial line and the inertial lines point toward the center of the Earth, right? Um, so it's not just you're, just, you're not just confined to the path, you're moved along the path. So in the vicinity of a black hole, there's no force you can have that could resist the motion of space-time pushing you into the black hole. And so things disappear into a black hole, right, from us outside the black hole. But at the same token, because of the, 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 the expansion of the universe, it's like the universe is surrounded by a giant sphere, spherical surface, that things disappear through. So in the very early universe, when it was rapidly expanding, right, in the very, like, earliest times, like, if you were like, you know, of course you couldn't exist. But if you could, you would have just seen like your whole universe just disappearing away from you, you know? Oh, God. Yeah. And yeah. so now it's doing it at a lesser and slower rate, but it's still the same phenomenon. So it's like a reverse black hole. Oh, that hurts my brain. I mean, I, I, yeah. I do sort of understand, I do sort of understand what you're saying. And it, and even yeah. just that, that tacit uh, understanding hurts my brain. Right. Like I can't imagine <laughs> like, all yeah. day long, you think about stuff all day long that most people would be like, "My, I think my ears are bleeding." Like, and <laughs> it's just man, like that's man. just an average day for you. Is is Dude. like how, how do you how, like mm. when I when I said before about reading Leon uh, Dr. Letterman's book and like I didn't even have a yeah. frame of reference for this stuff. And so when a lot of people start yeah. studying science and when they especially when they study you know these almost mythological sounding quantum ideas, you know? Right. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and there's like, what do you compare it to? Like when, when, when things are so insanely grand that our, our, our human brains have difficulty even yeah. just tethering them to grasp understand how, what do you do? Like, how do you start to try to parse that out? Man, it's even worse than that because I realize that it ain't what it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. nothing is nothing is man nothing is everything is a model everything is a construction right don't for a second think that your reality is reality it yeah. is to a degree but it ain't right and so lately man i've changed even how i think of myself right i i, I used to think of myself as a, like a human being now i think of myself as a world line and i'll tell you what that is um Einstein came up with this thing called a space-time diagram where you have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And you, or, you know, you think of events in there, but you can think of yourself as an event. When you're born, right, or at some point you come into existence as a reality in space-time. And you go through space and time, 
right? And then, and then you end, okay? Now let's talk about that time thing that we all intrinsically think we know, but it ain't what it is, okay? <laughs> right? Like, let me, let's, right? Like, right now, this moment that we're experiencing right now, you and me, we call this moment now. And we think that our now is the actual now. In all the history of the universe, right? We know there's 13.8 billion years that preceded us and even more potentially, right? <laughs> because we're kind of limited in what we under uh, in our understanding. We have no idea what is to come, but in all that volume of time, we think that our now is actually the now, right? But every human who has ever existed has thought that, correct? Right. So what makes our now the now and not their now? And not to mention every human there is to exist. So I guess my, just think we're observing it, but that doesn't mean anything really. They all, every, like what makes your now, their, right? So the thing is, is that as far as I know, it could be a hundred billion years from now, <laughs> right? As far as I know. So what I do know is that my world line exists. So the, to me, the existence of consciousness makes all times co-equal in a way, right? But I know that my world line exists and I know that it has ending, it ends. So what am I going to do with this, right? I, I have this. And I'll tell you what's really cool, man, is that we're not just a single chunk of human. We're made up of all these microscopic quantities, electrons, protons, and everything, right? They each have their own world line. So if you can envision this, the world lines that of all these things coming together to form you and they're constantly coming into you and out of you. It's like this creation with all this stuff flowing in, all of this stuff flowing out. It comes together small, it gets bigger and bigger, stuff flowing in, flowing out, and then it all dissipates. And then it comes, then it reforms somewhere else. And it, somewhere else. A planet, yeah. oh a my star. God. Yeah. I mean, listen, yeah. I just think of myself as like a lasagna suit for some gut microbes. Like, I don't even know. <laughs> I feel, like, yeah, I feel yeah. like, you know, there's these little, these little microbes in my gut that are yeah. driving this suit that I think is me, but really I'm just like, you know, a, you know I'm just like a, like a, like a, a meat mech suit for man. Uh, let me tell you my, I don't know how you did your quarantine PhD, but I was doing history of life and geology. Uh, and man, you know, I never found biology that interesting and and honest with you i didn't even remember stuff like the structure of a cell and you know i i i knew broad strokes nucleus mitochondria but you know the whole action of like making proteins and all this kind of stuff how things get in and out and motor proteins you know i, I you know, right so i was like this is amazing but then when you look at it we're just like big versions of amoebas in a way <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, kind of you know like yeah i mean it's <laughs> There's no, that's They'll do that's much more hard. than what they do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they make their own shows. Like they, you know, like they, <laughs> they make yeah. shows, they, they get yeah. their, they get amoeba coffee. Like it's, you know, like they yeah. have yeah. a little, who knows what their little societies are. I, I, you know, I just have to say, I absolutely <laughs> love talking to you. It's so much hey, man. fun Thanks. talking to you. And I, I, I am ashamed that it's been five years since you've been on this podcast. You absolutely should not be five years again before. You well, know. man, I was a part of the federal government now for a little while there. And so I restricted my activities. Uh -huh. as a good okay. Public okay, servant good. should. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's very yeah. nice. That's I, so I feel, yeah. well, I feel like something. Thank, thank you for lifting some of the responsibility. Yeah, man. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm, I'm real about it. And so I, I, I feel so, Man, you know, there's so much good to be done in the world. And so uh, I feel like, like I didn't, I never, you know, man, you know how I talked about young Hakeem when I was in the military and I was all defiant and all this. Yeah. You know, one of the things they try to drill into you too is look out for the person around you, right? Mm -hmm. And I was hard to get that lesson. And, you know, I was always make my stuff tight. So there was one time where I had a bunk mate and my stuff would be tight and his stuff wasn't. So I, I was punished until he got right. And then there was another time where a dude standing next to me, his shoes weren't shine right. So I was punished till his shoes were, time, were <laughs> you know. Yeah, but now, man, they did make a public servant, dude. So I go around the world for the State Department, you know, doing diplomacy for America, like helping other nations to develop their science education and their space 
uh, programs. And, you know, I, I do similar, you know, in, in America, you know, I try to, for America, I, I try to focus on education and identity, right? People from minority communities, you know, like me, you know, when I, when I talk about my book, a lot of the, the ways I behave was because I felt like the world told me that's who you are and that's how you're supposed to behave, right? You, you're supposed to be intimidating. You're supposed to be, you know, we, we know these caricatures, right? And, and uh, so, you know, my, it, it's funny to me how my military service, you know, I was so defiant about it, but in a way it set the foundation for everything I came, that came afterwards, not everything necessarily, but a lot of the work I do after that came out of it. It was there that I learned algebra, which allowed to me to become a scientist. It was there that I learned discipline, <laughs> really, you know, and it was there that I learned to look out for the human beings around me in a, in a different way than Mississippi taught me. <laughs> right. Right. But again, yeah. it's, it's also, you know, one of the many reasons why I think your story is, um, and I'm, I'm very, I'm excited to read the book. They're going to send me a copy of it. Oh, beautiful, uh, beautiful. And so I'm going to get the, I guess it's the galley. Is that what it's, I think it's the galley copy. I think yeah. It's- yeah. Like third, third proof galley. So there's like, you know, a, a couple of little ty- typos that will be in it, but not much. It's always but, I also, but I also am really eager to hear your audiobook version of it too, because mm-hmm. I think there's something really powerful about, an author reading their autobiography because it just it 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 just adds such an important dimension to be able to yeah. hear the nuance and to hear the yeah. you know, the emotion and and to, to, to yeah. it really feels like oh I sat down with Hakeem and he told me this amazing the you story know, this, yeah this story. man and, you know, let me tell you though man like dude it, dude emotionally man you know my 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 father so I basically in a way had three fathers. Right. There was my biological father, my uh, sister's husband, who was 11 years older than me. You know, I lived with them during my high school years. And then my Ph.D. advisor and my Ph.D. advisor and my uh, father died within, you know, some time of each other. And I discussed both of them at the end of the book, you know, and I discussed some of the last moments I spent with my dad. dude, And I just couldn't do it, man. You know, writing it was one thing, but then reading it out loud, man, you know, I tried to, I, you know, at first, you know how it is when you become emotionally overwhelmed, you know, at first you're trying to like swallow it down. You're trying to swallow it down. Down. Yeah. 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 Try to speak again. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, I got to go. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but what, you know, what I just had to like break did, down, man. But did you feel like that was an integral part of the healing process for you? Was that, was that like a, a final frontier of the healing process for you? Man, you know, I, I still, you know, writing a book was therapy in a way because I, you know, I didn't realize how much I had not healed. I had, I had overcome so much that I thought that I had overcome everything, and I had it, you know, and I and I hadn't overcome everything. Um, and 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 thank goodness, you know, the guy I was working with, Josh, is just, you know, he was kind of built for this. He was like my therapist for a minute, and and also, you know, it was really funny because you know his dad was a neurologist. You know, my dad dropped out of school in the ninth grade. I mean. In the, in, at nine years old, right? And so, you know, we would both look at each other like, what? You know? I'm like, you know, like I'll give you an example. You know, in my life, I moved a lot, right? It, 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 and that's a, whatever you're imagining, you're not <laughs> imagining enough. And so Josh asked my sister when he interviewed her, did you ever tell your mother that you didn't want to move so much, <laughs> right? And, and so, you know, man, anybody from our neck of the woods, if you ask them that question, or if somebody tells you someone asks you that question, you just bust out laughing because that is preposterous. <laughs> that notion is preposterous. You're like, uh, no, <laughs> no, I did not. And I would not. You know, are you crazy? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it, 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 I, man, you know, when it comes to dealing with self, you know, I had so much to get over in my youth, just getting to the point of being me was an was an accomplishment right because at heart you know i'm a nice guy you know fun loving guy but you know the world had me wearing this suit of armor and being a tough guy uh just for self-defense right um and you know being vulnerable is so powerful right if if you uh if you allow yourself to just be and especially if you do it in the service of others right It, it just it frees them and empowers them so much and and that was the crazy thing about how my life has turned out because, you know, I, I ended up where I didn't expect to end up. 
right? I, I, you know, I was always like humans, you can have, them, <laughs> you know, but I get so much fulfillment out of that more than any discovery or any invention. I, I you know, helping people's lot to better their lives, you know, and I know it's programming, right? As a, as a scientist, right? That's what makes our species so amazing is that we help each other. We teach each other, uh, you know, we die for each other. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, man, it, it, it's just, I'm, I'm still evolving and developing and I, and I think I always will until my world line just fades. The world line, I, I will never, I mean, like that, that is such a huge takeaway, just that idea. And also just thinking about ourselves as being like this infinitesimal part of this massive thing, the reverse black hole. <laughs> yeah. But dude, humans are so dope, dude. That's the thing. I, I'm so proud of you <laughs> as a species. <laughs> but you're, we're, we're super lucky as well, man. Like if you look at the history of Earth, the history of life, and you know, and how we ended up here now, and you know, and the stability of Earth and the time that humans have existed to give us this idea of normal, <laughs> which you know, no Earth is is dynamic. The universe is dynamic. It is out to kill us. And here we are, you know, in our little cocoon of life feeling nice and comfy for a couple hundred thousand years not counting when we were when we were reduced to a few thousand uh oh, the years yeah, ago. yeah yeah the yeah, 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 yeah 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 exactly not counting that event you know we've done pretty darn well and the fact that we were able to figure out how the universe works i mean that is from you know being inside of it you know that's like a bacteria inside your body figuring out what you are Right, your oh gut my God, that just fucking blew my mind too. <laughs> just like a bacteria <laughs> becoming self-aware in your body, and we are that, and we are that in yeah. the universe. We're these self-aware yeah. bacteria. Oh, Jesus Christ! Okay, yeah, so man. first of all, oh man. Okay, a quantum life, my <laughs> unlikely journey from the street to the stars, is June fifteenth. Yeah. That book yes, comes sir. out June fifteenth. I'm so yes, I can't sir. wait to I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear you read Wonderful. it. Um, and also season nine of how the universe works is Wednesdays at 8 PM on the science channel and streaming on discovery plus, which is such an amazing stream. I mean, like I honestly, I swear I'm not just saying that because you work for them, but it's such a well-organized streaming service. It's like, Oh, all the verticals are right there. You got the science, you have investigation, discovery you have travel, you have food, you got, you know, like, you know, like nobody knows that discovery is all that, right? It's insane. Like they figured it out. Uh, yeah. And so many companies are trying to scramble to figure out like what their streaming identity is. And Discovery's like, oh yeah, it's just all these lifestyle things. Anything yeah. you want, take your pick. And, but, and uh, you know what, man? I'll tell you this. This is a, this is another side. One one of the uh, like side gigs I've had is uh, you know science advisor, super rich folks type deal. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and, and uh, you know it's philanthropists and corporation type. And, and so I work with Discovery Channel. Before, years before I was on television for Discovery, I mean Discovery Communications, not Discovery Channel. Right. Excuse me, and Science Channel. Years before I was on television with them, I was a science advisor. And the thing that's crazy to me is, you know, you think of, you know, when you're an average Joe, as I have been for the vast majority of my life, you think of yourself as insignificant, right? But then you can walk into these people's corporations and say, I have a few, re- you want me to give you recommendations? Sure. And then they listen to you and do it, then put you on television and then say, how would you like to be chief science officer? Right. <laughs> that was my experience with discovery until I joined the federal government. Right. And then I, you know, uh, was doing that, uh, you know, working with NASA. So that's how good they've been to me, you know, and, that, and, and, and I think that's the part of the story. When you look at my story, my story isn't, oh, man, I'm so dope. Look at what I did. You clearly see that if it wasn't for a whole bunch of people that showed up to help me out, I wouldn't be there. I wouldn't be here, right? People being nice and helping you. And, you know, you've done that with me. Science Channel's done that with me. You know, it, it's, it's, and it pays off, you know, and that's why I do it because, you know, if people hadn't done it for me, what the hell would I be? I mean, I just, it's such, it's been such, it's such an honor to be any part of your story. And I'm so delighted that you know, uh, to have you on the podcast five years ago and just to see all the amazing things you've done, you know, even in just five years since the yeah. first time you came on. And, and, and honestly, I please, it, I do not want it to be another five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see how things are in a year <laughs> or two. Yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up, man. I got some other projects in the works. <laughs> oh, good. Please do. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. It, shoot me an email or just, you know, like, yeah, that's what I'll do. You know, and, and by the way, I'm not like, I know you're super busy, but you know, I might just check in every once in a while and go, how you doing? You know? And you know, well, I can't believe I'm hearing this. Because I'm, you know I'm, what? Like, what? Here's the thing that's so wild to me. When we first met, like, dude, I didn't know how big you were. Right. I knew you existed, but I didn't know how people thought of you until I afterwards. Know, I was like, oh, this interview with this guy. Everybody's like, but here's the crazy thing you gave me your cell number dude and i and i've hit you up so many times over the years and you've always answered me and you've always been gracious so why would you think for a heartbeat that i wouldn't be so happy to see you pop up like give me a break you're, you're Listen, I, you know i'm a fucking comedian you're like saving the planet like i don't know you know like i <laughs> like you're doing important work and i'm making yeah. martian fart jokes i mean which you know if i just to credit myself turned out to maybe be a thing but yeah. you know, <laughs> so you know my point of view like you're way up here and i'm like hey man yeah. i hope we can hang out nah, sometime man. <laughs> no man, it's it's that flow, man. It's that vibe and that flow and that chemistry, dude. Like, cause, cause you know, you know how it is. When I called you, I'm like, Chris, I need help. What do you think? <laughs> that's how, that's anytime, anytime. Yeah. And you're, you like, know, anytime you're like, you're like, I can I mean, help or anytime yeah. I can yeah. give you information or anything you need. You know, yeah. all you have to do is yeah. all you have to yeah. do is I haven't help. called you, man, in years. So my bad. You've been a little that's busy. 20- I know I've been a little busy. I've been a little, but no, you know, I take it seriously, man. I take what I do seriously. And I really took that, that, that federal government thing really, really seriously. Like I'm so paranoid about everything. You know, I want to make sure I don't like my first day, the council said he introduced himself to me. He goes, okay, my job is to keep you out of prison. The the council. And I go, <laughs> I make this part, like, what, what did I do? He's like, don't get me wrong. I said it to everybody. He thought I was somewhat seniorish. Right. And he's like, I say that to everybody, but it's really true, man. You know, the rules about things like, you know, gifting and talking to people and hatch act and then all the uh, spying stuff that happens, you know, it, 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 you really just have to, you know, man, I, and I tell you this, let me say this while I'm on your, your thing, because the thing that I realized when I got there is, uh, you know, we, we have a sort of culture of a discussion about the people who do this work in Washington, D.C., right? We call them bureaucrats. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a constant mantra to reduce the size of government. And so I didn't think that meant NASA. Right. I didn't think reduce government equals cut down NASA. And when I got to NASA headquarters and saw that it was run by a skeleton crew of scientists virtually and saw what their workload was. And when I saw them, I already knew their names. So I'd read all their papers and I knew how great of scientists they are. And they choose to serve just like I chose to serve. And they are so, man, their workload, dude, is crazy. Um, and they're great people, you know? And, and so I just wanted to give a shout out to these folks that are up there. And, I, and, and, the way, and here's the other thing, man. So imagine this. I have a foot in the TV world and a foot in the federal government world. In one world, they try to treat me like a star. And in the other world, we're watching your federal dollars and trying not to waste a penny. Right. right. <laughs> so that means I'm in the cheapest rental car, the back of the cheapest plane possible. But I say that to say that these people, that's what their life is. Right. They're not jet set like that. They are sacrificing and thinking of just like you join the military to serve. You join the federal agencies of the government to serve in the same way. Right. People have that same mentality and they're amazing people. And I just wanted to get that out there. Absolutely. Well, please come on anytime. Even if in six months you're like, hey, let's or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Anytime, please reach out. I, I will do, I will I will talk anytime. Doesn't it, it does not have to be a podcast. It can just be All a right. hey, you yeah. know, I was just calling to say hi. I'm totally I'm totally open for that. Sounds good, man. I appreciate you. I I, I definitely appreciate you, Chris. Thank you so I much. I appreciate you too, man. It's so good right to on, see man. you. And please take care and uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. ID 10T scanning complete. Enjoy your burrito.